and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, I look at the news and top selling games from December 1987. I compare Robotron clones. I play some games, have a chat with Jeff, and end with a book review. But first, it's the news. With the arrival of the new Plus 3 machine, the disc compilations are starting to flood in. The extra storage means that there can be several games per disc, and companies such as US Gold and Martek are quickly throwing together compilations. Martek's offering include Slain, Cat 23, Nemesis the Warlock and Pulsator for just $14.99. Companies are also coming around to the idea of releasing games on disc, with plenty on offer including Outrun, The Pawn and Starglider. DKtronics have been taken over by RAM Electronics. RAM, the makers of peripherals such as the Music Machine and the RAM Print, now own the entire DKtronics range, including the name. They assure users that the products will still be available and will still be supported. CRL have become the first software house to have a computer game rated X certificate. Jack the Ripper has been given the 18 certificate by the British Board of Film Classification, even though they have never actually seen the game, and games are not even covered by the ruling. So this looks like a bit of a publicity stunt by CRL. The board said, after seeing the script and a screenshot from the game, the clause that would trigger the 18 certificate is the one about mutilation and torture. Because of all the fuss this is raking up, WH Smith have refused to sell the game so I guess CRL's little tricks may have backfired. Virgin have bought the right to a large chunk of Mastertronic games, who previously bought out Melbourne House. The size of the chunk that has been bought is unknown, but Virgin will be looking to release back catalogues at budget prices. And now onto the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month are Renegade from Imagine, Taipan from Ocean, Indiana Jones from US Gold, Bubble Bobble from Firebird, and Joe Blade from Players. And that was the news and top selling games from December 1987. Robotron, or to give it its full title, Robotron 2084, was a classic arcade game released in 1982 by Williams. Alongside Defender by the same company, this frantic shooter was one of the first to give the player twin joysticks, one to move and the other to shoot. The idea of the game, like all classics, is simple. Run around, destroy the robots and save the humans. Fast action and iconic sounds would be difficult to pull off for home computers, so how did the Spectrum get on? This is Arena 3000, released by Microdeal in 1984. This game varies slightly from the arcade by having no humans to rescue, despite it saying this on the advert. The game places you in an arena, obviously, inhabited by robots, and to progress you have to disable them. I say disable because when you shoot them, they don't explode, they just stop moving. These are then a hazard that you have to avoid. Lining up the shots is tricky because of the placement of the graphics and you usually have to run around to try and get a few shots in first. To add an extra challenge, the walls slowly shrink every few seconds. The graphics as you can see are basic and small and move in character squares but control is crisp, which is a good job considering how fast things move when you get down to the last robot. Sound is used well and there are some nice effects there, but the gameplay is just too frustrating.
And now we have Exterminator from Silversoft, released in 1983. This is quite a close version of the arcade game. There are robots to destroy, humans to save, different types of robots, some of them firing and others not, robots you can't destroy, and a hectic pace. The graphics are large, and you can tell what things are. They move smoothly, even when there's a lot on screen too, making for a very arcade-like experience. Control is crisp, and you certainly need it in this game. Sound is well used too, but the Spectrum can never match the iconic sounds emanating from the Robotron cab. As you progress through the levels, things get really tough, with plenty of dodging and firing. The arcade had separate fire and movement controls, so you can move in one direction whilst shooting in another. Here though, the direction that you're moving in is the direction that you're firing in. This means that the game is more tricky, but it also means you can use a joystick to play it. A good game then. Next we have Robotron by Krypton Force, released in 1985. This is another game very close to the arcade, but suffers from very bad keyboard layout, at least on a PC keyboard when using emulation. The game uses symbol shift for down and L for up, which works fine on a rubber keyed machine, but try using that on a PC keyboard. The footage from the emulator will contain very short games. Most of the arcade elements are here, chasing robots, humans to save, and deadly obstacles. The graphics are small though, and move in character jumps but the hectic pace and panic-inducing action are all present. Sound is used well with some good effects too. Overall, not a bad game if played on a proper spectrum. And now on to the official release, Robotron 2084, released by Atari Soft. As you would expect from an official port, the game is very accurate to the arcade machine. There's no separate firing and movement controls though, and firing is automatic and is on all of the time. So in effect you just have to run around and avoid things, which is harder than it sounds. The pace of the game is fast, probably too fast, and that meant short games. The hectic pace means it's difficult to take everything in you see on screen, and so find yourself hurtling about and running into robots and other deadly things. This is a bit of a shame, as the arcade game is not this fast, and as you get to level 3, there are so many things on screen it's impossible not to run into them. The graphics are well defined and move smoothly, and sound is excellent. Control is crisp, but the sheer pace of the game does rather spoil things a bit. A great conversion then, if you have the reflexes of a ninja. And now on to Wild West Hero, released by Timescape Software in 1983. The screen looks very similar to Robotron 2084, the previous game, and it uses the same constant firing mechanism too. But there's one major difference, this game is better to play. The pace is just that little bit slower, meaning you can progress, and it doesn't become frustrating. In fact I think the game pace is spot on. You get enough time to escape the initial charge, manoeuvre around and line up shots, which is great. graphics are well drawn and move smoothly, even though there's a lot on screen, and the action is fast and furious. Sound is used well too, with some great effects. Control is responsive, and overall gameplay feels just right, although by level 4 things get very hard, and there's very little room for manoeuvring. 
There are no humans to rescue either, so this is just a plain shoot and avoid game. But a great one at that, and one I enjoyed playing. Well that's it. That's the end of the shootout. Not many games in this one. And the winner is... well, it's been very difficult. The game I enjoyed most was Wild West Hero, without a doubt. And even though it had elements of the arcade game missing, I felt this was the best of the bunch. The official part is arcade accurate, but was just too difficult. This is Devils of the Deep by Richard Shepard Software, released in 1983. It claims to be a stunning 3D graphic adventure, where you take the part of an intrepid underwater explorer looking for treasure in the city of Atlantis. Have I loaded the right game? Really? Oh well. You move around, slowly, picking up useful items like knives, spears, and if you can find it, a spear gun. The knife is used to cut seaweed that you can eat to keep your strength up. Of course, there's no mention of how you take your suit off to avoid drowning. You can jump to adjoining screens by holding down the shift key, which is the best way to move about really, until you spot something you need. You have limited amounts of oxygen, and this can be replenished by picking up oxygen cylinders. And as you shuffle about, your strength is used up, and these can be seen at the top of the screen. And you haven't even found a spade yet. Did I mention the spade? Yes, you need that to dig up the treasure, but I never found one. The graphics are not what I would call stunning. Let's just check that again. Stunning 3D graphic adventure. OK. The seabed is pretty much the same regardless of where you are, with just random pillars placed there and random items. The game is dull and slow as you plod about, and I suspect this game is written in basic. Richard Shepard did this with Transylvanian Tower. The game loads bytes instead of code, and there is a special code to drop you back to basic. Now, this game also loads bytes, and by pressing break at the right moment, you can get into the listing. There it is in all its glorious basicness. Back to treasure hunting then, and oh dear, there's the Devil of the Deep, a huge electric eel. If you meet this chap, you can either shoot him, if you have the required items, which is a spear gun and spear, or run like hell, or hide behind a column until he goes away. As you wander about, your strength starts to drop, and if you can't find the knife, you know that you're never going to get to the end of the screen, and inevitably, you die. What a relief. Let's move on to something a little more exciting, shall we? Like painting the shed. This is DNA Warrior, released by Cascade Games in 1989. A clever, or in my opinion crazy, professor has injected a growth accelerator into his own brain in the hope of becoming super intelligent. Obviously it all goes wrong, and an explosion causes him to go into a coma. The only way to save him is to jump into your assault craft, shrink down to a miniature size and get injected into the old man himself. Sounds like the plot to Fantastic Voyage to me. Oh well. Once you're in the bloodstream, you have to fight your way through the body. Because the crazy fool has inserted other things into himself, no sniggering back there, these must first be neutralised by collecting certain keys, and these open gateways into other areas of the body. You also have to collect eight pieces of the inhibitor, which look like snakes that have swallowed eggs, and these are used to disable the implant if you can reach it. So 
So as you've guessed it, and as you can see by now, it's a shoot 'em up You fly around shooting things, collecting keys, collecting snakes, sorry, inhibitors, flying back through meteor storms of white cells, I think, and find gaps to move on. Rinse and repeat. The scenery does change every now and again, and there are power-ups to collect. You know, the usual things like speed up, vertical fire, rapid fire, and other things. The graphics are large and smooth, as you can see, with a variety of backgrounds, but similar things to shoot on each level. It is, of course, inside a body, so you're not going to get a whole range of things. Sound is a bit poor, even on a 1 to 8K machine. There's some nice music, but in game it's just beeps for firing and collecting things. There's nothing for explosions, section transfers, or ground based lasers. Hang on, ground based lasers inside a human body? What has this crazy fool been doing? Control is responsive, and the gameplay is fair. It's not too difficult to get into, but some sections, like the white blood cell meteor storms, can be tricky. As you know, I like shoot 'em ups, but for some reason I just couldn't get enthusiastic about this one. Here's a quick story. The people who wrote this game lived near the computer shop I worked in in Harrogate. They brought the Amiga version of this in for us to look at, and I said I wasn't impressed. I don't think they like me. If you're listening, guys, sorry. So, an average shooter then, that you might just want to have a try at. This is Snake Escape by Ina Saukas, I hope I pronounced that right, released in 2016. The game uses the Bitfrost multicolour engine, which gives brilliant graphics that really show off the spectrum. The idea is simple, you have to guide your snake around a maze to reach the apple. However, your snake is not very good at climbing and can only reach up a short distance. This means you have to plan your route to ensure he doesn't get stuck in holes and can use his stepping trick to reach higher platforms. You cannot move backwards either, so planning is very important. Later levels have boxes that can be pushed to fill in holes so the snake can move over them. As mentioned before, the graphics are good and it's certainly a challenging game as the levels move on. Sound is used well too, and there's a great tune at the beginning of the game. If you do get stuck on a level, you can press fire and it will reset, and you can have another go. Which is a good idea, I think. This is a great game. Very enjoyable, and can be quite addictive. This is definitely recommended. Go and grab a copy now. This is 3D Spawn of Evil released by DK Tronics in 1983. The plot, and yes there is one, is quite complex, but to try and simplify things, huge alien eggs are spewing out smaller breeding aliens. If these meet, they turn into larger aliens. If these meet, they turn into eggs, and the cycle continues. 
The game gives you two strategies really. You take out everything as quickly as you can, complete the game and have a low score, which can be done in about six seconds if you're lucky, or wait for more aliens to be produced and act as a sort of gamekeeper, not allowing too many of them to breed, thus getting a massive score. All this, of course, is explained in a nice manual on the tape. Once into the game and we get a rather nice 3D space shooter. If you don't touch any of the keys for a few seconds, you will go into scanner mode, and here you can locate the eggs, aliens and fusion points. Pressing any key and you're back into the action. You can fire normal lasers or cluster bombs, and these are fired by holding down the fire key. The graphics are okay for a 16K 3D shooter, and things move smoothly enough around the screen. Sound is well used too, with some nice firing and explosion effects. Control is responsive, which is good, and this game can be challenging, especially if you opt for the gamekeeper approach. You have to be careful though, if you allow three eggs to form, they enter seek and destroy mode and come looking for you. Overall, in a nice simple game that can be played in a variety of different ways, each of them enjoyable. So this time we're going to have a look at Android 2, which was another one of my picks. Android 2 was released in 1983 by Vortex. And Vortex were really famous for their 3D games, so they did TLL and Cyclone as well as this. And this was kind of their first 3D looking game. They used that strange forced perspective 3D where you saw everything from one angle. And 3D was really only shading, but it does play a part in this game. And that it hides some of the things from you. It hides part of the maze from you that may have mines in it. Um, which adds another dimension to the game. And for me, this game is kind of... It's kind of a maze shooter with a bit of a puzzle element. Because you've got to figure out the best ways to get around the maze. I enjoy this game. I'm not a huge fan of shooters. But I do like shooters to some extent. The strategy element uh, part of it is is one of the things I like. So what did you think of it, Paul? I remember actually buying this game because I'd purchased the two previous games from Vortex, which were Gunwar, which was excellent, and Android 1, which I thought was a brilliant game. And I was hoping for better things with Android 2. Android 1 was 2D, mm. and, and as you've already said, this is a 3D game, which was quite remarkable when I first saw it. It uses a similar 3D effect to an old game called 3D Escape by New, Di New Dimension Software. But I think it does it better. It's obviously larger because the 3D Escape was all in one screen. Yeah. And this is a, a large scrolling maze. And I played it for a few times and then I put it away because I just couldn't get to grips with it. And I thought it was way too hard. However, when I played it for this section, the first time I played it, I killed all of the worms. Wow. And I know, but I, I couldn't get back to the point because I, I hadn't read the instructions that far to find out what you did after you'd killed all the worms. <laughs> The game ended because you have to get back to a point, don't you? Is it a transportation point or something? Yeah, and you don't have very long. I was I was quite amazed that I'd managed to kill all the worms. And I've never got that far again. Um, I played it, I don't know, 10, 15 times again after that so that I could get some footage and also get um, get more of a feel for the game. And I think each time I played it, I, I played worse and worse to the extent where I think I lost all my lives in, in the first 10 seconds on the last time I played it. <laughs> I think, I think I got I got trapped between a mine, a worm, and one of those red things. I remember reading, I think it was in Crash Playing Tips years ago, that if you walk, if you had one life left and you walked over a mine at the same time as one of the... If you stepped onto a mine and got hit by one of the baddies both at exactly the same time, you had infinite lives from then on. Oh, that's interesting. never tried that. I've tried it loads of times and cannot do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
for, for people watching the videos, um, the red robots can't be destroyed. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, because I, I, I've only had about 15 goes at this. No, so you right. can't kill the red things. That's right. You can shoot the blue things. Yeah. And to kill the worm, you've got to hit it in the head three times. Yeah. And there are how many? Five worms to kill. And then once you've killed those, you have to get to a transportation point somewhere, um, which should be marked on the scanner bottom right. It, well, I, I've never noticed it being marked on the scanner bottom right. No, uh, that, <laughs> when, when I when I managed to kill all the worms first time, and I, I didn't know what to do, and I was looking at the scanner, and I couldn't work anything out. But the other thing is, I think the transportation point is where you start as well. Oh, right, okay. I think it's where you start. It may not be. I thought I thought you had to get back. You had to get back. I've always I've always assumed you go to where you start, but maybe you don't. But my cousin once completed it, completed the first one, and got on to the next maze, hmm. which is kind of more of the same. It's a bit more twisty turny from memory. I've never done it. I, I've I've killed all the worms a few times and never got to the transportation point. The the one thing I did like about this game is they changed the control method from Android One. Because Android 1 was a rotate and move type. Yeah. So you ha your left and right keys rotated and then you forward moved. Whereas this one, whenever you press the direction key, it automatically rotates and, and starts moving in that direction, which is a hell of a lot better. Yeah. Although that can that can be a bit frustrating if you're trying to move really quickly and you've got to wait for the robot to turn. And and, the, and those mines are a pain. <laughs> they, they are. Um, they're, they're a real pain. They don't go away when you step on them either. They stay there. <laughs> I noticed that. Yes, several times. <laughs> Which is another real pain. I mean, but, if I'm gonna uh, if I'm gonna criticize the game, I criticize probably the scrolling. It blocks scrolls, yes. and that does mean that when you're close to the edge of the screen, you can't see things coming. Now, I think that adds to the strategy element a little bit. But this is this is one of those games where if you just run, if you just try and kind of plow in head first and you don't run and take your time a little bit uh, you'll die quickly i think that's one of its strengths is the first thing you want to do is you want to go around shooting things because that's the sort of game that it seems mm. but it's not is it it's it's a slow paced strategy you have to think your way around the maze and you and i think you've got to watch the movement patterns of the red things and work out how to get there's there's often a little cubby hole or something that you can like follow one of the red things and duck down there and then he comes back past you and then you come out and back along and things like that yes yeah, yeah. But it's a great game. I mean, I I like the three D effect, but I criticise it a bit. And sometimes you can't see a mine or something like that. I've never had a mine that's been hidden. Are there mines that are hidden behind the walls? Yes. No, oh, right. That that's not that's not fair at all. That's sneaky. I, I know that because we played it about what well, half an hour ago. Uh, the, the mine that was hidden behind a wall. So that, quite often, a dead end. Wrong. Don't run into a dead end. It's it's better than I I remember it being. Put it that way. I I thought it was. I don't know. I think I think I went in all guns blazing when I first got it, and it and it put me off because it was it was so difficult, and I didn't realise you had to start planning your route. Do you agree with me that it's a one more go game? Yeah, I I kept going back to it. That's because I kept standing on the mines. <laughs> <laughs> There are a few books now available covering many aspects of the spectrum and computing in the early days. I have covered several of them in previous shows, but I wanted to point you towards this one, Deus Ex Machina, the best game you never played in your life. It was written by Mel Croucher, who you may know from Automata UK, the games company that brought us the Pie Man. I purchased this book from the man himself at Replay Expo, and it's an excellent read. It covers the early days of computing, before the spectrum, moves on through the people involved, and includes great material about Automata themselves, including an excellent and funny part about how they took on Waddington's over the copyright claims to Monopoly. With the book's title, it obviously covers the game itself, Deus Ex Machina, a game well ahead of its time, and covers how it came to fruition. It tells how the actors were involved, and tales from the recording studio, it covers why the game got to number one in countries it wasn't even sold in, and how W. H. Smith refused to sell it because the box didn't fit their shelves. The Automata breakup is in there too, along with the intervening years, and ends with Mel's task of getting the game recreated and re-released. The book is a funny, revealing and interesting read, and it's definitely worth tracking down.